It is always a challenge to introduce in brief academicians and scholars who have eminent body of work to their credit. And we shall make a humble effort in that. Dr. Binayak Datta, our session chair for today's panel discussion, is an assistant professor of history in the Northeastern Hill University, Shalom. With the research focus on partition studies, displacement, migration, citizenship, and socio-political study of Northeast India, he has several national and international publications to his credit. To name a few, Partition and the Citizen Imbroglio in Northeast India, The Elusive Indian, The Predicament of Determining Citizens Between Politics and the Law in Assam, Muted Voices, Gendered Memories, Some Notes on Violent Uprooting from Partitioned Assam. Dr. Datta also has authored books, namely, History of Judiciary in Assam, Law, Law Courts and Lawyers, Religion in Politics, Eastern India, 1905-1947. Thank you, sir, for consenting to become and come part of the panel. Our panelist, Dr. Hem Jyoti Medhi, is an associate professor of English in Tejpur University, Assam. Her research interest lies in gender and literature, women's movement, vernacular public spheres, oral history, and digital humanities. She's a recipient of the CEPFIS, International Institute of Social History, Amsterdam, Preserving Social Memory Grant, and the Charles Wallace Trust Fellowship at SOAS London. Some notable publications include Tribe, Caste, Nation, Gender, Chandraprabha Sekhyani's Presidential Address to the First Assam Kachari Mahila Sammelan, 1930, A Herculean Task, Women's Education and Christian Missionary Intervention in Assam, The Making of an Archive, Memory, Movement, and the Mahila Samiti in Assam. Dr. Methi's forthcoming book is titled Gendered Publics, Chandraprabha Sekhyani and the Mahila Samitis in Colonial Assam. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us. Professor Kedilizu Kiki is a professor of sociology and chair professor, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Chair, Tejpur University, Assam. And he has a research focus on sociology of Northeast India, tribal studies, ethnic movements, sociology of development. Some of his noted publications include The Naga Homeland Movement, Historical Trajectory and Contemporary Relevance, Identity and Tribal Land Alienation in Northeast India, a sociological viewpoint on changing land relations with reference to Nagaland state, ceasefire and its impact in Nagaland, a critical appraisal, politics in Nagaland from military to electoral democracy. He has also authored and co-authored books, namely, The Dynamics of Development in Northeast India, Angami Society at the beginning of the 21st century, Changing Gender Equations with Special Reference to Nagaland. Thank you, sir, for being here. Professor V. Krishna Anand is a professor of history in Sikkim University with research interest in modern and contemporary Indian history, historiography, constitutional history of India. He was a fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, New Delhi, during which he researched on the retreat of the Nehruvian Socialist Project, a study on the political, legislative, and the judicial interventions. He has several international and national publications to his credit. To name a few of his books, Between Freedom and Unfreedom, The Press in Independent India, India Since Independence, Making Sense of Indian Politics, The Indian Constitution and Social Revolution, Right to Property Since Independence. He was also associated with the Hindu as a journalist for over 13 years. Thank you, sir. For the panel discussion, we have a time of 50 minutes, followed by Q&A. We will take the questions at the end of the discussion. So I request all the participants to put the questions in the chat box. And if you wish to address a question to any specific speaker, please do mention the name as well. We will be sharing a feedback form at the end of the session, and we request all of you to fill the same. I now hand over the session to Dr. Vinayak. So please. Uh, Dr. Binayak, I think you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. As I said, 
at the very outset, uh, thank you so much, Piyashi. Thank you to your fantastic team. Uh, you know, I think uh, congratulations to the mentors and advisors. And it's a huge privilege uh, that I have to be part of this panel. Uh, Northeast has always been very, very close to our hearts. Uh, Professor Anand, uh, you say you're not, you are, and you are not from the Northeast, but you are from the Northeast and we assert that you belong to us. Uh, the other three, Professor Kiki, Dr. Medhi, and myself, we uh, belong to this place. And so we are all today gathered here to talk about a place that belongs to us and we belong to it. So when we start talking about Northeast, uh, there are three ideas that invariably come to our mind. Uh, the first, we talk about cultural diversity. Northeast is actually a museum of cultures and people. The second, we talk about Northeast, a land which invariably started off as a land which connected the two Asias. The Asia, as we understand, as in uh, what remains to the west of India, and the Asia that remains to the east of India. And Northeast India essentially was a connector between these two great parts of the Asian continent. Um, but invariably we talk about the transformation of the space and now we talk about it in terms of a frontier, we talk about it in terms of a borderland, we talk about uh, you know, invariably a region which uh, is extremely challenged because of the fact that it's only connected to mainland India, a term that Professor Anand spoke about, connected to mainland India only with 22 kilometers. You know, this whole, whole discourse of connectivity, connections, and how does one necessarily look at this region? And the third, uh, which in my understanding is, uh, an, under which, uh, is an image of Northeast India, which is extremely, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's something that uh, spreads far and wide, uh, a region of contest, you know, contesting narratives. I think Northeast invariably, if you task, ask anybody uh, who's not familiar with this space, uh, they would not talk about the diversity, they would not talk about the beauty, they would not talk about much, they would talk about the contest, you know? So it's invariably uh, a zone of contest. Uh, so uh, with these three, three ideas, uh, the Northeast is an idea which is a borderland, a frontier, a zone of contest, and of course, a lovely space which is basically a museum of people and cultures. Uh, I think it's interesting to talk about this region. Uh, a region as, uh, you know, somebody at the very beginning said, it's a direction, you know, the term Northeast is a direction, but uh, it today has come to acquire a certain geospecific, geospatial connotation. Uh, to, to initiate this discussion on uh, this fantastic idea. Congratulations to the team for uh, proposing this theme, uh, contesting narratives, rethinking the idea of India's Northeast to get into this discurs discursive process. Uh, we have eminent uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Medhi, Professor Kiki and Professor Anand. Uh, we have, as uh, Piyashi had pointed out, 15 minutes, but. Uh, can we start off with Professor Anand? Uh, uh, very, very, you know, with three panelists, one after the other, talking about their idea of Northeast India. What essentially is the idea that Northeast uh, brings to your mind? Professor Anand, uh, both of us are uh, joined together through disciplines. We are both historians. Uh, so I, I start off with history. Uh, whatever you do, uh, history is the foundation. Professor Anand, the idea of Northeast India. Yeah, I mean, let me let me try to sort of, you know, I mean, uh, start this whole exercise uh, with a personal anecdote. Mm -hmm. My first ever exposure um, to some part of the Northeast, to uh, a very definite part of the Northeast, was in the in the late 1970s and the early 80s. That's when I started reading newspapers, and the first ever exposure was to uh, the idea of you know who is an insider and who is an outsider coming out of the northeast i'm talking about this movement in assam in fact you know i mean um, uh, the, 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 the newspaper reading uh, the generation that started reading newspapers then had this uh, image of the northeast 
as something something you know where it was problematic in the, in the sense there were bomb blasts that were reported there were agitations that were reported there were reports that uh, the the petroleum the crude oil that was required for the refinery in Barroso was not uh, not coming and then india was going to land in a crisis in some sense my first ever exposure to that region was not about you know the, the serene beauty of the forests the mountains the rivers and the rivulets it was not about uh, the people there it was not even about you know today we are talking about the 150 uh, 20, 25th uh, birth anniversary of netaji bose my first ever exposure was not even about uh, this region through which india was sought to be liberated with japanese assistance on the contrary as a student of history my first ever exposure to the region was that here is a poor place which is a trouble spot but then but then it was also alongside similar quote and quote troubles that were beginning or rather sort of happening in punjab that were beginning to happen in kashmir and in some sense the idea of northeast wars and as presented by the regime at that point of time that these are all regions where forces from somewhere across the world from across the border are trying their best in the two balkanizing so in some sense you know there was this first image a stereotype that you know there are parts of the country which are on the margins jammu and kashmir and uh, punjab on the northern uh, margins and the rest of the north particularly assam and assam constituted and the reason why i am sort of not telling this even even i mean in in the in the course of living in sikkim for the past 10 years or so and between the 1980s and you know by the time i had come to sikkim my idea my exposure to the north east had definitely sort of you know changed i i managed to travel into various other parts of the north east into the into the arunachal pradesh into nagaland and you know so many other places and you know it it came to my mind that this is not a trouble spot as much as it had come to my mind so many Traveled into Punjab. That this is a trouble spot, and you know, sometimes the understanding that Delhi knows all, that Delhi is going to sort of you know decide what the rest of India wants, was the cause of the trouble. And in that sense, the roots of the trouble, whether it was in Assam or in Delhi or or, or in the rest of the northeast, or uh, let's say uh, in in Punjab and elsewhere. had to be located in that certain kind of an attitude that the post colonial indian state adopted that delhi knows all and one size one size fits all and even after all these things as i came to live in sikkim a whole lot of my friends including friends in the academia including friends in the, in, uh, in various various other parts of what we can uh, call cerebral Things, would call me up every time there was something wrong that went wrong in Guwahati. If the Brahmaputra flooded, they would actually call me to find out if I was all right. And I said, yes, I am all right. But why is it that you are asking me about it today? And they would say, no, no, we we heard that there is a lot of rainfall and uh, parts of Guwahati are flooded. So I had to sort of look at it. And between the two, when I had when I was moving to Sikkim. when i was moving to gang when i went to actually get my lpg connection shifted the lpg agent actually told me okay i am writing gahati and you may actually sort of you know get it changed everywhere anywhere to gang talk so all this actually sort of you know i mean uh, leads to leads to this kind of an uh, imperative a need that those of us in the academia have to talk about the north sea and have to keep talking about the north sea to the rest of the world so that that you know, we do, we do not we do not actually sort of you know have to have to sort of you know uh, uh, lead to a generation after us that would actually believe in the same dream so what is actually sort of you know central some of these causes the most important uh, aspect of the quote and quote and i keep sort of you telling this quote and quote whenever i use the word trouble in these parts of the country as i actually indicated 
suggested a little while ago is the kind of tendency or an attitude or an approach in New Delhi that New Delhi knows all, one size fits all, is something that is actually sort of, you know, more pronounced vis-a-vis -vis the local region even today. Let's take the case of like so the, the Heidel projects. Decisions are taken in the Northeast. Decisions are taken in the Northeast at the very apparent level, I say, because the state governments have, have seemingly empowered, are seemingly empowered to invite anyone and everyone to set up any projects, which is again some reversal of the centralized plan process that governed India until the early 1990s and before the Washington consensus came in. Now, this reversal, in my view, is not a reversal for the simple reason the state government, rather than having been empowered to negotiate directly with anybody who comes in with money for investment and the kind of development that was happening in the agenda, on the contrary, in my view, governments have been further disempowered, further disempowered. The government of India, which is a larger entity, a perspective, is in fact, you know, more equipped to ensure that the natural resources, that the, the, the ecology, that the people, their culture and their rights are protected, rather than the state governments, because... The state governments at one level are deprived of any kind of revenue generation and have been pushed into a kind of a situation to take wake up as much revenue any which way possible, notwithstanding the impact, the adverse effects that such activities will lead to on the society at a later stage, ecological, cultural, and so on and so forth. The state governments then are turned desperate also because employment generation is considered and generation of employment of a particular kind is considered to be the only governing activity of the state governments. And what happens here is there are money bags, carpet baggers who actually land in, in a particular airport, have discussed with a particular chief minister of a state to negotiate the terms of a project. Later on, they go for lunch with the chief minister of another state. Yes, that I am getting so, so much of concession from that state. If you are going to give me more concessions, I can come to your state. And for the cup of tea in the evening, they go to the third chief minister and do further bargaining. Finally, the state governments, the chief ministers are effectively disabled by this kind of apparent decentralization process. It is happening across India. It is happening in Tamil Nadu. It is happening in West Bengal. It is happening elsewhere. And this, I think, is something that we need to be concerned about because the Delhi knows all and one size fits all attitude and beginning the 1960s and into the 80s what others called it the troubled periphery. Now, this exactly is now sort of, you know, likely to happen multifold. And this, I think, is a threat that those of us who are concerned about the region, not just about the Northeast, but elsewhere in India, are also got to be sort of, you know, focused upon and we talk about it. So particularly when we are actually rethinking the narrative, one needs to sort of, you know, look at what has happened to the Northeast in the era after 19, 1991, and unlike everybody else in academia and uh, those uh, who talk about it, I would not want to use the word liberalization for that. On the contrary, whatever happened in 1991, in my view, has to be called India having adopted the Washington consensus. And that, I think, is a major challenge that you know, one should take up. This does not mean that there aren't other challenges. There are challenges in the domain of culture, in the domain of language, in the domain of diversity, and so on and so forth. And you know, with this, let me sort of, you know, thank you all, and thank you, Binayak, for actually sort of, you know, preferring the discipline of history. In fact, you know, those of us historians are also, and we, I, I personally think that uh, you know, we have all the rights to be arrogant. Because history to me is a discipline that, I mean, if you avoid, if you actually sort of, you know, I mean, 
not consider it in the mainstream than the society is doing. And in that sense, the, I mean, it's an arrogance that I think is justified. I can see some of my, I mean, some deep actually smiling. So in that sense, thank you, Binayak, for actually giving me the opportunity to start to start the whole discussion. You know, I'll be I'll be eager to answer. Thank questions. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Anand. Uh, that that actually starts off setting the scene for contesting narratives, and to essentially start the contest, I think we need to appreciate that history is a continuous dialogue between the past and the present. So, well, uh, you have set the past to us, and probably now we are going to take the discussions forward. To take the discussions forward, uh, we we probably uh, need to also correct a gender imbalance. You know, we have three men uh, and there is a lady, a, a, you know, a solitary lady in this panel. So I think it's only right that she should have uh, the right to express her mind. And she is, uh, you know, somebody who's worked on and from Northeast. And so let us now invite Dr. Medhi, Hem Jyoti Medhi, to share her thoughts on Northeast India. You know. What is Northeast India? What is the idea of North India? Dr. Medhi. Am I visible and audible? Yes, yes ma'am, ma you are, yes. Okay. First of all, uh, you know, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for uh, bringing this central question, you know, about contesting narratives uh, while conceptualizing uh, Northeast and Northeast as Related northeast as uh, you know, both northeast as a direction. Uh, so for today's uh, talk, I have uh, I have kind of titled it as uh, "Code Framing a Question: Colon How Do We Re Dash Search in Northeast?" Question mark unquote. So uh, I'm playing on the term research and research. Uh, I mean, Leif, is there some uh, audio problem? No, ma'am, it's fine. It's fine. You can go ahead. Uh, there, but I think uh, because somebody's, uh, you know, voice was unmute, it's okay, ma'am. You can carry on. Okay, thank you. Huh? So I've been lately trying to conclude this manuscript that you mentioned. And uh, this is precisely the roadblock I face. And I work on uh, early women's associations and I read books on uh, women's movement and women's associations which were active in uh, say colonial Bengal, Madras or Bombay presidencies. And I, I read these excellent books in their lucid uh, you know, space. Uh, and uh, I feel that there is a kind of an unsettledness that I face uh, the moment I think of this work being located in Northeast, and there's this constant sense of belonging slash alienation, you know, uh, Professor Dutta talked about it, Professor Anand talked about it, not, not just as an insider outsider, but, but as uh, how do I represent this uh, space that was the Brahmaputra Valley in colonial Assam, which was practically the large parts of Northeast today, and how do I represent a few Mahila Samitis or women's associations active then? And uh, you know, what kind of questions do I, uh, and how do I situate them? So I uh, really uh, am kind of thinking aloud today uh, because these are not fully developed arguments, but a few notes. And I'd really appreciate if your questions and comments help me to you know, formulate this better. So uh, as part of the work that I was engaged in, uh, and Piyasha mentioned about the CEFIS grant that we received to create a digital archive of the Mohila Committee papers. And uh, we digitized papers at three Mohila Committees in uh, Tezpur District Mohila Committee, Dibruga District Mohila Committee, and Assam Pradehik Mohila Committee, Guwahati. Uh, um, the earliest papers that we have is from 1928. So it's a very rich repository of handwritten minutes of meetings, bills, photographs. And uh, the second part of the archive is audiovisual recording of women's memories of working in the Mohila Committee. Of course, these are women who were active in the Mohila Committee in the 60s and 70s, because by the time I was working, people active in the 30s and 40s had already passed away except for Shanaprabha Mohanta and Nira Dogra who were active in the 30s, 40s. 
Uh, so, uh, of course, the creation of the archive itself was a struggle. And as Bodhisattva Kaur has said, that if you uh, want to work on the Northeast, the first thing you do is to create your own archive because there is no ready archive. But uh, for us, the question was, what do you do after you create the archive? Because uh, how do you translate the archive into uh, research that is recognized and is considered as qualifiable and tangible research output. And that's a struggle that I still have, you know, for instance, in our annual performance appraisal or whatever. So the radio talks that we created or the short film that we created, none of that would be regarded as, as standard research output, right? So that's the first question that I face, you know, how do I translate the archive into research? But the second question is what I want to uh, engage today. And that is when I began this research almost a decade ago, uh, Northeast India studies was an emerging discipline where researchers like us were caught between the heavy quote unquote Western gaze, uh, which conceptualized the so-called you know, exotic, beautiful tribes, vis-a-vis uh, -vis our own location as native informers, you know, trained in methodologies, which are mostly, uh, you know, which have originated in the global North academia. In fact, uh, Akotong Longkumer has talked about and has problematized the gaze that constructs the Nagas during the much publicized Hornbill Festival or uh, Ben Coulson uh, or, or William Van Schendel, you know, thinking about Zomia as an alternative way of uh, moving away from the way we look at uh, Northeast. Uh, but as Professor uh, Datta mentioned, as, uh, and also Professor Anand, uh, the idea uh, that remains central to the imaginary that is Northeast is the idea of Northeast India as a frontier, as a borderland. And the second is that that backwardness is endemic to these locales, you know, that it is intrinsic to our space, that, you know, in the developmental paradigm. Now, uh, as has been mentioned by the panelists before me, this is a very successful discursive production of Northeast. You know, that Northeast is outside the rubric of development that, you know, and this production, discursive production is as much a legacy of colonization, very, you know, beautifully elaborated and, and which is continued in the present uh, by the panelists before me, the lazy native syndrome. Uh, as well as a sustainable uh, political economy, which Sanjeev Burwa has called durable disorder of our contemporary times, right? So this discursive production is not just that colonization is over, so that is over, that there, it, it is sustained through different uh, discursive processes even today. So while the production and consumption of this discourse of underdevelopment have, you know, has facilitated a number of crucial studies, I believe it has also limited the frameworks from within which uh, Northeasts or parts of Northeast may be viewed or written about. Uh, it is important that we recognize that these narratives about Northeast as backward and you know, outside of the developmental uh, paradigm is implicated by larger structural processes. One of those has been just indicated, in the, uh, you know, uh, hinted at by Professor uh, Anand. However, as we engage with archival papers, and because my work is on early women's associations, and we have middle class women tenaciously writing in beautiful hands, articulating their own in their own local language, in this case, Ahomia, I believe we do see trans-regional connections of local histories. And while it might be tempting for me to say that this is going to lead to some tectonic shift in my research, I am humble enough to understand that what it allows us is a methodolog methodological shift. And I, this is what I want to explain in the next five or seven minutes. Uh, so uh, I want to enter this idea of researching Northeast through the cooperative, or even cooperatives that uh, Mohila Samitis in the Brahmaputra Valley established since the 1920s and successfully ran till the 1950s. Uh, these weaving cooperatives were uh, run by the Mahila Samitis across different Samitis in the Brahmaputra Valley, primarily at Kamrup Mahila Samiti, Tejpur Mahila Samiti, Gulaghat, and others. Uh, interestingly, Tejpur Mahila Samiti is the only one who still has its weaving cooperative intact. The rest of the Mahila Samitis, as far as I am concerned, I, I do not have knowledge of having the uh, cooperatives continued. 
But before I speak about uh, this cooperative, I just, because it's not necessary that everybody knows about the Mohila committees in Assam. So uh, while we're talking about contesting narratives, the uh, dominant reading about the Mohila committees or these early women's associations in the Brahmaputra Valley, both academic as well as members whom we interviewed, is that they almost uh, visualize these as playing a second fiddle to the nationalist movement. And uh, uh, that is how uh, many academics have looked at them. And that is how also some of their own members have remembered the Mohila committees as working for the Congress. Uh, however, internal documents of the committees, as well as you know, records uh, which are available, say in contemporary newspapers, reveal a very, very interesting and uh, you know, exciting story. And I believe that uh, we see the, the, these committees asserted agency, which went beyond the agenda set by the contemporary nationalist leaders. To give just one example, and I have already written about it, so I don't want to you know, go on detail in the 1934 mini marriage controversy, uh, which is published in a book called Communities of uh, Assam, uh, Communities of Women in Assam, edited by Professor Nandana Datta, published by Rutledge. And uh, this controversy in 1934, and I'm so glad that Professor Anand mentioned Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, because that is where I found the microfilm copy of the Ahomia Weekly newspaper. And I spent six months just going through that microfilm, uh, you know, reader. Uh, and when I, when I, because I always had, uh, I used to read, you know, women's memoirs and autobiographies, they would write that the committee was called Biabhunga committee, you know, the Mohila committees were called uh, associations that break marriages. And when I asked younger, you know, peop, uh, like people who were young then, and I'd, I asked them, why, why do you think, what is the origin of this? And they said, no, no, because they tried to stop some marriages. So, so nobody could really tell me what was the moment that actually consecrated this kind of a, and they were called other names also. They were also called Puharir male, which would roughly translate as a fisher women's meat. So it, it, you don't have these, uh, you know, name calling uh, if you're playing a second fiddle to the Congress, right? You definitely did something which was unsavory to the contemporary uh, public and which was kind of, for them was monumental. So uh, in 1934, they served this legal notice to a groom uh, to stop the wedding of Mini Goswami, who was a 12-year-old daughter of Gondhamoy Devi. By, by uh, uh, interestingly, Gondhamoy herself was a Mohila Hamiti member, and uh, the father was Ambika Goswami. The marriage did was temporarily put off, and later on there was lots of pressure, and. Uh, several rounds of, and the, the Homia Weekly runs more than a month long story on this. So when I first came across, it was so exciting to, you know, see this almost half page full, uh, half a page coverage on this controversy. And uh, the fact that the Homiti split, the Assam Mohila Samiti, which was established first in 1926, split in 1934, uh, immediately after this controversy, speaks volumes about the kind of subversive potential that they unleashed. So uh, as you can see, I'm interested in agency. I'm not just interested in, they are middle-class women and I'm not denying, I'm, and there are issues about not reaching out to the tea garden coolie, not being inclusive about certain sections. And, and I've written about that elsewhere, so I don't want to go uh, those spaces. And there are problems with the Mohila Hamiti, I'm not denying that. But uh, because we're talking about understanding Northeast, uh, in order to understand women's agency, the weaving cooperatives can become one of our tools. And how is because, uh, and of course, I recognize that if you're talking about weaving, if you're talking about khadi, then the imaginary of the nationalist uh, Swadeshi is immediately there, right? I mean, we cannot escape that. But the moment the Mohila Committee has an impasse with government of India regarding yarn quota, it, that imaginary is not simply only about the Swadeshi. And that is what I want to uh, you know, give an example from one of their own papers. So this is from a moment in 1948, 49. And please uh, uh, stop me if I'm going over time, okay? I'll take another five minutes or so. So 1948, 49, January uh, 1948, and they have this resolution uh, and they, they regret that uh, given the shortage of yarn in the country, the government must stop supplying yarn to factories and divert these a special quota to the district Mohila Summit is to be further distributed among weavers. So uh, 
and this battle continues. So this was January 48. Then again, they take it up in June 1949. And this time they say that the government has released Japanese trade into the domestic market and the Indian government must take note that this may lead to the utter failure of the cooperative societies, okay, unquote. Now, in order to understand what was it that they were talking about, you know, this cotton textile control and what does it really imply? So I did a little background and uh, the cotton textile control order was passed in 1948 and it deregulated prices, which led to high prices in yarn and cloth. And ostensibly this was done to encourage uh, handloom sector. But the Assam Mohila Samiti, by now, of course, it has been uh, renamed as Assam Pradehik Mohila Samiti, felt so threatened with the change of policy. And I, I could only understand why they felt threatened by reading H. Fukazawa, who is an economic historian uh, of India, as you, most of you are aware. And Fukazawa, in fact, says that the rise of export in 1950-51 by the mills is the result of change of policy in 1948. So despite, so in a nutshell, uh, despite the apparently quote-unquote handloom friendly policy of the government of India in the years immediately after independence, the Mohila Committee Cooperative could not fit into this paradigm of development. The disjunction between the Mohila Committee's vision of women's participation in production and the states, the, the new nation states conceptualization of progress is apparent and stark, stark. Unlike the spiritual foundations of Swadeshi in Gandhi's scheme of things, the Mohila Samitis were engaged with more material questions of production, such as scarcity of yarn, sustenance of handloom, and with increasingly hostile policies of the center. And you know, the, the very survival of women's cooperative is at stake. The Samitis had successfully integrated women's customary links to production, both in real economic terms, as well as in self-perception of the weavers. This model of development, however, was eventually displaced by the new Indian nation state with its acceptance of the mainstream industrialized and capitalist logic of progress, right? So it is important that we value both the symbolic and the material potential of a practice like weaving. And I was glad that in your promotional video, you had a millisecond of uh, a woman weaving because weaving is one mode of uh, customary practice that women across tribes and caste in Northeast had access to. So the Samiti was emphasizing on the materiality of labor as well as women's relationship to the economics of production. So I'd like to argue that perhaps questions of nation, community, Ohomia identity, you know, which were prominent in some of the other agendas, were subsumed within these basic questions of everyday livelihood sustenance and aesthetics of weaving, of course, because the weaving cooperatives didn't only market uh, Mechelas and Sadars and all that. They also marketed books, um, you know, they, they sold uh, jams, pickles, jellies. So, you know, this alerts us that we may see the weaving cooperative not just as a practice, but as, and this is something that I'm still framing, so I may not come as, as very clear, uh, but I want to see this as a cognitive tool for us, which are not necessarily grounded by established frameworks. So if we are able to see that women were trying to conceptualize a new way of participating in this new polity with linkages of customary and traditional practices. We, it might help us to research heterogeneous and polyglot societies differently, where we are aware of identities, diversities, cultural differences, tribes, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, that there were moments where collectives like the Mohila Hamitis, and I'm sure for every researcher, these will be other tools, right? So for me, it was the Mohila Hamitis weaving cooperatives. For somebody else, it would be something else. Where these collectives could imagine an alternative frame through which they could participate in a new polity. And, and because this is 1948, 49, it's so crucial as a moment, right, in the, in, the, in the imagining of the new nation. So in conclusion, the Northeast may be a helpful category. It is a helpful category, no doubt, as long as we are aware of the illusions we make in looking for the whole. While I do believe that there is a collective, but instead of that collective being shifting versions of us and others, it is time we understand the several layers that may be laid bare only if we are 
attentive and sensitive to material questions, to questions of everyday struggle of livelihood and survival. Thank you. Uh, Binayakta, you have to unmute yourself first. Uh, Dr. Medhi, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it, it's really nice that you bring to the table something which is first, uh, the various layers of understanding this region that we are all part of, Northeast India. And you actually do it so beautifully through uh, the lens of gender, through the ideas of tradition, and with the question of livelihood. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's actually going deeper and deeper. Uh, Dr. Medhi, uh, Professor Anand, I think Northeast, actually the many layers, many, many ways of understanding Northeast India is coming forward. Uh, I now uh, have the privilege of inviting Professor Kiki uh, with your ideas of Northeast India and uh, how does one necessarily look at the idea of Northeast India? Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, at the very outset, I would like to thank the organizers, Athenian, uh, for this platform. And I also appreciate, I think, the very idea of uh, such a platform. And as is reflected in your uh, theme, pa panel theme, uh, contesting narratives, uh, this is also a way of uh, providing alternatives, I think, alternative platforms in that way uh, to understand uh, Northeast. Uh, thank you, Chair, Dr. Binayak Datta. Uh, we have uh, my co panelists, Professor Krishna Anand, and my colleague, Dr. Hamjuti Medhi, and participants from across states in, in India. Now, when, this, when I gave this uh, uh, theme, uh, contesting narratives, rethinking the idea of India's notice, uh, many things were uh, coming to my mind. And in a way, I have written some points here and there, and a little bit disorganized, but having said that, not, not that uh, I'm not serious uh, today discussion. I'm equally serious uh, to the discussion. Now, I agree with the other speakers before me, Professor Krishna, Dr. Medi, and even Dr. Binayak, or for that matter, uh, the, the organizers, where they have uh, introduced to us what exactly is the purpose of this platform and what are the uh, intentions for such a such a platform. I agree with them. I will try my best um, not to repeat some of those points. Uh, and I will try to maybe perhaps add to the already uh, laid points by my co-panelists and the chair. Now, the first idea that comes to my mind on these contesting narratives, like say, uh, one of the panelists have already mentioned, uh, say, we have this insider, outsider, inside, insider notice, outsider notice. <clears throat> and this is necessary. And in that way, uh, how do we perceive, how do I perceive notice as an insider? Now, this is where I think we have so many subaltern narratives or contesting narratives. And I think a time has come where academicians have to start looking at notice perhaps a little bit differently, whether we perceive notice as one single conceptual category, we call it a sociological unit, or, um, or, or do we look at notice as um, uh, the earlier speakers have said, notice as varied diversities. And uh, that's one thing as an insider, again, even as an outsider, how do we conceptualize? How do one conceptualize and understand notice? Or for that matter, uh, how is notice known to others? How do our outsiders look at notice? How do Delhi perceive notice? And whether the perception of Delhi or notice is 
Are we responsible as academicians from Northeast? Are we responsible? Have we presented ourselves in such a way which has perhaps allowed people from Delhi to perceive us uh, in, 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 in such a way? Uh, for example, say, um, do we look at notice or how do they look at notice? Do they look at notice as an interdependent economic system? And that's how developmental packages are coming. Or are we using the perception to bargain, to negotiate with Delhi? When you, when you put notice as a single conceptual category, is it a way are we negotiating with notice? And, and if it is so, uh, is, is it solely from a developmental kind of perspective or, or what exactly are we trying to do? And I also think uh, Dr. Binayak was right, uh, say, uh, to start with history. Now, in such a topic, are we contesting the past? Are we, are we contesting historical narratives? Because to me, understanding, conceptualizing notice, two, two things are very important. When you look notice as one single conceptual category, then we look notice as one, a single geopolitical entity and their reasons, as has already been mentioned. You look notice as a geopolitical entity connected to the rest of the notice, or as somebody has already said, gateway to Asia or gateway to Southeast Asia. And all these uh, policies such as ES from uh, um, 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 uh, uh, East policy, for example, today we have. So, so uh, uh, this kind of uh, these things, um, uh, perceptions, this kind of uh, per perceptions are there. Now, before um, I, I come to some of the points which are in my mind, I say how. Uh, this let me allow me to take you back to some of the writings, and that has been already discussed again and again. For example, say for so many years, maybe till um, 2005, and here when I say 2005, how is notice perceived? Uh, is notice perceived as from a security perspective? Or, and I'm repeating some of these arguments which have been argued earlier by many social scientists. Uh, some of the names like Atul Sama, for example, say he has uh, been engaged with some of these arguments. Uh, it's not as perceived from a security perspective rather than a well articulated developmental perspective. Uh, these are some, again, when you look at the very establishment of NEC, Northeastern Council. And, and like say, why for that matter, till 2005, for that matter, Northeast Council was put under Ministry of Home, Government of India, and governors, and not under development ministries of, of, of for that matter, like other states, not under planning commission. Is it solely because Northeast has been perceived as from a security kind of perspective and not from a developmental uh, kind of project. Now, when we look at notice again, and this is where really, now I'm, 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 we are not simply blaming here in Delhi, perhaps Delhi's perception of notice, we are also responsible because maybe we have presented notice uh, uh, in that manner to notice. Now, many of the, for that matter, developmental projects that have come in notice uh, uh, till recently, till recently, were in response to public agitation. Tezpur University, for that matter, itself is a response to Assam, Assam movement. So or for that matter, the first bridge at Brahmaputra came as a response to people's agitation. Or, or for that matter, refinery oil, I, I, I things for that matter. Uh, so it looks like it's a dog responses. Till public agitate, uh, it, it's, so the, these are questions, again, if you look into this context, whether um, um, I will come to internal narrative, internal alternative narratives. Not before that, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing here how Delhi, for that matter, and why I say Delhi, Delhi capital, perceives not this. Now again, into this context, um, whether Delhi really understands, as I agree with Professor Krishna, for that matter, 
uh, whether they really understand the notice. Or, or, okay, it may be good when we're trying to negotiate, when, you, when we present notice as one single category, conceptual category, trying to negotiate developmental packages. Yes, fine. I'm not saying let us not stop that. But then, do Delhi really understand anything beyond Gauhati? Or when we project notice as a single category, are we, are we benefiting only Gauhati? Because when you do not understand anything beyond Gauhati, uh, then, then it, it's good, perhaps, to the residents of Gohati, that notice is projected as one single political category, one single conceptual category to negotiate developmental packages. But if Delhi is feeling to understand beyond Gohati, Gohati benefits. What about the rest? This is where it takes me, it brings me to the argument where I'm trying to title my presentation as understanding, contextualizing and understanding notice. What is my, what is my idea of uh, what is my idea of uh, notice? And what are the alternatives? What are the alternative narratives? It can be in terms of nationalism, when we have so many in terms of different ethnic groups. The very question of, say, for example, say, uh, Assam has been, I mean, uh, debating on the issue of CAA, and Vinayak is, uh, is specialized specializing that maybe perhaps he can bring that uh, argument later Let's see see uh, um, so for, for, for example for for, for exa example that what is what is for that matter my very uh, idea of um, notice what is your for that matter what is your idea of what is your idea of uh, notice this is where we have alternatives different ethnic groups the very question of nationalism. Today, I think these are academic platforms where we should not even shy for that matter to discuss the very narrative, the very narration narrative of nationalism. I think another challenging uh, issue facing a notice is, and that's where we need to listen to the alternative narratives. See, the question of uh, land, the question of borders, Assam, take for example, Assam, Assam is having border dispute with uh, almost every other state it neighbors. Or for that matter, when we talk about border issues, the issue is border dispute that is, I mean, um, I mean uh, happening between Manipur, uh, uh, um, Nagaland states. I think these are, these, these are, these are issues. Um, I think we're, um, oh, we need to discuss the question of ethnicity. So, so, and that's where I would like to discuss, or I would like to place for discussion, for debate. Uh, 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 what are the other, what are the other narratives? Do we have alternative uh, narratives? See, for example, take for that matter, take the question of a uh, Bruce. And this is where, which takes us back to the very issue of when we talk about CAA, for example, say, uh, who is an indigenous? Who is an indigenous in Assam? Or who is an indigenous in, in, in Nordis? Are we really, are we simply, uh, um, um, uh, I mean, uh, stopping at an idea of, of the dominant narrative, of the dominant group narrative, or are we willing to listen to the narratives of the marginalized, uh, Dr. Hamjoti Mehdi was bringing in this women perspective, Samiti perspective, for example, say, are we, are we willing to listen to the narratives of, 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 of women as a marginalized group, as a marginalized category? Are we willing to listen to the narratives of the so-called marginalized groups in, in, in Nordic? Take the case of Bruce in Mizoram, for example. Are we willing to listen? Because to me, we are academicians and uh, for, for to understand notice, I think notice has varied diversities, as already mentioned by uh, co panelists. We have varied uh, diversities, and, and, and so, so and, 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 and to do research on notice, to really look at notice, um, I think uh, that's where we need to look at a varied uh, uh, alternatives. 
Take the case of Bruce, in, for instance, in Miro. Are we willing to listen to the Miso narrative? Miso as the general category, which includes Luce, Lai, etc. Whereas, how, are we willing to listen to the narrative of the Bruce? Are we willing, for that matter, to listen to the narratives uh, of the Chakmas in Tripura, for example, in Mizora? Are we willing to listen to the narratives of so-called, in Assam, we call it TGL, Tea Garden Liberators? Um, so these are the, we need to contest and uh, as students of social scientists in Northeast, I think we need to, to have, to understand Northeast, our researchers uh, need perhaps needs uh, to give new direction, new importance uh, to looking at specificities, specificities of different varied um, diversities. Now, I, I was mentioning the case of Bruce, Chuck Mas, for example, TGL, and, and, don't and don't misunderstand me. I'm talking here as an acad acad academician. What are our researchers supposed to be? Now, the majority of the region's population composed largely, perhaps, of displaced and dislocated ethnic groups cut off from ancestral roots. They often feel themselves or are made to feel that they have no history, history less, or they are denied a pass. Now, a number of narratives are competing for primacy as the national historical kind of narrative. Now, when we're talking about a dominant narrative, a historical, national historical narrative, is this so-called national historical narrative which has become the dominant, which has become the most competing primacy, primary? Is it based on the old colonialist tradition? Because whereby, when we look at British imperial story of the use of British exploits and aggrandizement with an emphasis on its Civilizes, civilizing mission. And a great here is Britishers, colonial imperialist story is simply to increase the power, status, and their, and their wealth. Now, a celebrated colonialism and popularized notions of dependency, this is vis a the natives. So you're a native. To civilize you is my mission. So you are, the narrative is what? What is the colonial narrative? Right? That you as a native, you are supposed to be dependent, you're supposed to be subservient to me, and you're, you are inferior. So this, 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 this is the colonial narrative. So if we are talking about, about a dominant narrative today, it could be on anything. It could be on your nationalism, it could be on your indigeneity, it could be, you, it could be on your uh, ethnic group, or it could be anything. Now, do we base, do the dominant narrative, are we willing as an academics, as academicians, are we willing to look at alternative narratives? Now, where are the alternatives? Historians and social scientists agree that nationalism and national identities, ethnicities and ethnic identities are all constructed or invented at specific historical conjunctures and that the creation of narratives about the past is nearly always an important aspect of this process. Now every past, every claim to truth about the past is open to interpretation. Are we willing to interpret differently? Are we willing to interpret alternatively? Are we willing to listen to subaltern narratives? It could be on any issue. This is, this, is, this, is, this is my argument I'm, I'm laying before the, um, I mean, the gathering. Now, reconnecting the past is an active, constructive process. It's not a simple matter of retrieving information. To remember, narrative comes here. And in even subject like sociology, we have this perspective called oral, oral narrative where we make an old man recollect the past and we're trying to understand and even which this old man has witnessed. So this, is, this becomes 
um, um, difficult. To remember is to place a past, a part of the past in the service of conceptions and needs of the present. Now, all post-colonial states in particular have undergone a process of national self-creation, a process of identity formation involving a recasting of history to produce a usable past. Allow me to read some of these things I have written. Nationalisms are invented and their claims to the historical continuity are always expressions of ideological and political concerns. And this is equally true of the construction of ethnicities and ethnic narratives. Allow me to quote unquote Timothy Brennan. Nations are imaginary constructs that depend for their existence on an apparatus of cultural fictions. Uh, this is where um, allow me to bring you back to whether I really understand Northeast. And this has become a concern for me, especially for me also. Uh, uh, forget about administrators, politicians who so-called represent us um, in Delhi or at administrative platforms, at policy making platforms, even us academicians, I think this is where we need to ask whether we really understand our case. For example, say a number of seminars, we call it national seminars. We simply caption it as something, something, notice. But actually notice is never represented. I think this is it's a challenge because I attended a few programs where it is captioned as marginality, etc. for example, notice. I say, don't think Kiki is representing uh, the entire Nagas. My knowledge on Nagas is restricted perhaps to a few uh, tribal groups. So if somebody asks me today about Kiki, do you know about Tikirs? In, or do you know how much do you know about Kemgans, Kemgans in um, uh, Eastern Nagaland bordering Myanmar? I say, I no, I cannot, I cannot. So, so this is a challenge. And in fact, this is also where we academicians are, are um, um, posing, we posit a danger of too much generalization or visualizing, knowing, noticed. Why we may not? Notice has to be understood. This is where I agree with my co-panelists and earlier uh, speakers that notice has to be understood as varied diversities in terms of its different ethnic groups, different linguistic families, and political units. Again, this is a matter of concern again, political units ranging from authoritarian hereditary monarchy to democracy bordering anarchy. We have varied social organization. This could be of interest to students of sociology. Uh, uh, Dr. Binay has mentioned, he has begun a cultural dimension, cultural, and, and earlier speakers have mentioned about cultural, it notices like a cultural museum. I agree with that. Family organization, kinship, religious diversities, and various art forms. All of these varied diversities are embedded in its history, I think. And, and now, when we look at Northeast, an extreme Northeastern part of India, which we know that, and we share this, we have these international boundaries with Bhutan, interesting. And this brings us back to whether somebody is interested or somebody is interested in not because we share international boundary with Bhutan, somebody is interested because we share international boundary with China, Tibet, Myanmar, or Bangladesh. Or what are we willing to do? Let's, that brings me back to the question I'm asking myself again and again. Are we willing? Me as an Angami for that matter. An Angami is, a, is, is one of the major tribes in Nagaland. An Angami, is, it, is he willing uh, to give credit or is he willing to listen to alternative narratives of a Tikir who is considered a sub-tribe in Nagaland, or a Romai who is considered a sub-tribe in Nagaland. Now the region, are we interested in Northeast because the region is geographically isolated, which 
um, or, or, or are we looking at notice as are we interested in notice because we look notice as a geographical uh, recognizable entity, or are we interested to understand notice because there are significant variations within the region due to due, due to the topography of the land, um, and this is characterized by numerous hills and valleys, streams, rivers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, when we understand notice. Um, I have mentioned linguistic categories. Allow me to quote Linguistic Survey of India, where they have mentioned that as many as 420, a little bit, I think relatively old data, but 420 of the six, 1,650 languages spoken in India are in Northeast, for instance. Look at the political history. I think this is a matter of concern again, political history. The emergence of political units. Um, 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 uh, we need to understand this. Um, it's, it's, it's the emergence of political units from our, it's based from, in other words, in migrant social basis. A migrant social basis. We have different type of political informations, even in, if, you, if you take us back to British colonial, uh, colonial rule, we have Hindu or Hinduized kingdoms, the beauty in varied political units. We have Hindu or Hinduist kingdoms. Uh, we have many tribes. We have different tribal political organizations. Take the example of Kassisianships or uh, chieftainships, which exist among the Konyaks to, to some extent among the Suminagas or for that matter, the Lushais. In, in, in the Mizo Hills, for the matter, the Lushais, chieftainships. Uh, many tribes have village councils, a kind of organization with very deg various degrees or with different degrees of political, administrative, and judicial powers. Take the example of my own tribe, Angami Nagas. They followed democratic norms in running their villages and community affairs. I'm, I'm taking you back to even British colonial, during the time of British colonial rule. So it ranged uh, from all this. You look at notice today and how um, uh, notice today has, <clears throat> uh, for that matter, so many special provisions. Um, and these provisions are simply to protect traditional political and legal institutions. Um, and, and we have the history of notice, have the history of say so many, for that matter, under this, if you allow me to take you back to the constituent assembly under the leash, subcommittee leadership by Gopinath Bodoloi, six schedule, for example, or for that matter, uh, Article 244, for the matter, and special, so many problems, Article 371, cross A today. <clears throat> and, some, some, somebody can may bring in this issue, uh, not allowing 33% reservation of women in urban local bodies in, in Nagaland. And the state legislatures, they, had, they cited Article 371A, simply not to allow women reservation, 33 women reservation in urban uh, local bodies. These are these, these, the provisions are there, constitutional provisions are there, and how these constitutional provisions are interpreted or uh, how these, are, these constitutional provisions are, in other words, contested. Now, when we look at ethnic conflicts and insurgency, I'm putting insurgency, insurgency within court, insurgency movements, and so there are so many causes. It has gone through so many phases, processes. <clears throat> So ethnic movements have arisen, we also know, because of important historical reasons. Uh, this is, these are another issues. We see varied differentiations, even in social organization, cultural dimension. You just simply take the instance of family organization and kinship. Vast majority of the tribal groups, for example, they practice, they follow the trilineal system of descent inheritance. You look at classes. Jantias, Garos, for that matter, matrilineal system. Differences, again, even among them. Take the case of Rabas who are in Meghalaya, Assam. They have retained, interestingly, matrilineal descent, but they have abandoned matrilineal inheritance. The Masas, Jewels, descent system, they trace their descent through male as well as female, metric clans, patric clans. 
interesting. So these are interesting uh, concepts. And so we see so many variations. Lastly, I would like to put to the house an argument that has been bothering in just one minute uh, for quite some time. And I think this perhaps will become the biggest challenge of notice um, in, in the few years to come. This is where uh, cartographic lines, contestation over borders, border disputes uh, between the states. And when I say the states, these are more states. And we are willing to look at cartographic lines. What could be the alternative? If you look at oral traditions and history, it suggests that the ethnic groups at Northeast borders, they lived in widespread accord, sustaining soft jutted boundaries, till very recently, when the modern state and its politics resonates on administrative divided lines. The borders and the ethnic groups were never at dispute, though until lately, they're confused or rather misled, only to realize their ancestral lands situated on either side of the administrative state boundaries. Now I'm inviting an open discourse. If the political state boundaries needs to be revisited historically, and I'm talking here as an academic, not as a politician, and redrawn, or we simply rely on the ancestral inherited ownership without perplexing it with the political boundaries. Concern here is whether we can rely on the linguistic contours as an alternative, whether we can rely on the vernacular place names to contest the given cartographic lines. And you can take cases, Manipur Nagala border. And I think as academicians, we should not shy to discuss. We should be willing to listen at various alternative and narratives. So many concerns I have simply added to some of the concerns raised by the chair, uh, the organizers, and my co panelists, adding to some of the concerns. And, and my question here is to myself and to academicians, scholars from notice, especially the younger scholars, um, whether we are willing to look at the specificities, whether we are willing to look at subaltern narratives, or whether we are willing, or, or, or rather, we continue to um, 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 engage with only dominant narratives and not uh, listening to the alternative narratives. Uh, this, is, this is my cause. I've raised some of the concerns. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. You have to unmute. Benai, Dr. Benai, you have to unmute. Yes. We've had uh, tremendously interesting uh, conversations from all the three panelists. Uh, they flagged very, very important issues. But there's one issue which I think which is uh, fantastically relevant in all the three, uh, be it uh, Professor Anand, be it uh, Dr. Methi, or uh, be it Professor Kiki. Uh, they've invariably talked about the primacy of the national historical narrative. You know, uh, Professor Anand started off by talking about you know, how does one necessarily talk about Northeast? Uh, is Delhi telling us how to speak? Uh, Professor Medhi uh, invariably told us about how gender dimensions invariably were not articulated, because as we know, both the state, the society, and the nation are all patriarchal. Uh, and the third is uh, Professor Kiki telling us about essentially who speaks for the nation. And how do we recover the voice of the nation? Because one of the most important challenges that we face when we're talking about Northeast and leading is the talk of representation, both uh, in public media and in the community space. And uh, how does one necessarily recover the community voice? You know, uh, we, we, I think uh, the organizers would uh, invariably remind us that we have kind of overshot our time. Uh, we, uh, we, we want to uh, probably take a questions. Uh, and uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you talk about the questions, a larger uh, concern uh, 
that has been expressed uh, across the board has been about how does one necessarily contextualize uh, the main issues facing Northeast India? You know, the questions of livelihood, questions of representation, questions of employment, uh, the questions of belonging, uh, you know, and, uh, and I think we would have a, a quick response from all the three panelists, uh, a very quick response from all the three panelists uh, on how does one necessarily look at the way forward? You know, if I may use a very cliched word, uh, you know, it's a very cliched kind of thing to, to talk about uh, the way forward. But I think, uh, you know, when Professor Kiki, uh, you know, spoke about uh, recovering the community voice, uh, how does one necessarily recover the voice of the people? So uh, uh, can we have a very quick take from all the three panelists? I start off with Professor Kiki. He spoke about the challenges. Uh, sir, I want you to tell us, how do we recover it? And then we go to Professor Anand and finally close the discussions with uh, Dr. That's the order. Uh, <coughs> Professor Kiki, how yes. do we recover the price? Yeah. Uh, I think, like, say, as I have said, um, if we, there will be no one line answer, perhaps, but one way is, I think, um, natives, for example, say, instead of um, me, for, for instance, as a major tribe of another community, instead of me speaking for a Kikir, or instead of me speaking for a Kyamgan, I think we should, especially as a kid, maybe to start with the visions, uh, we need to give them a space. We need to hear their voices. I think every narrative is by the end, well, um, which narrative, uh, because every narrative for that matter has to go through uh, three phases. How, uh, in other words, how it disseminates, for example, say, um, uh, uh, how uh, the narrative is um, uh, placed. But then I think every, we need to give space to, we need to start listening uh, to the mar marginalized uh, so-called uh, sub-tribes, for example, say, uh, I think in, in anthropology, we call it uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the voice of the lesser non-communities. I mean, we need, to, we need to listen to them, to start with academician. And that's, that's, uh, that would be uh, my take. I was trying to give an example, for example, say when we have this dispute, border dispute, um, I, I'm, my, my take on, for example, border dispute, and this I have written down here, uh, uh, what is there, for example, say, uh, um, the question of redrawing cartographic lines, which has become, and, and uh, let us not forget that the cartographic lines drawn are simply, we have simply inherited from um, uh, colonial administrators. And take an example of uh, Manipur and Nagaland state border. Both 1842 line, 1872 line uh, uh, has done in a hurry. It is imaginary and it is arbitrary. Now, are we willing? Are the, the states willing to listen to the ethnic groups in, in the borders? Um, like, say, what is there in a local? vernacular name or place names? Is there any history or symbolical meaning attached to whose name, for that matter, or dialects? Are these strategic points which have become a dispute today? Are there narrative stories attached to these place names? How do the contested communities draw social solidarity through these names and narratives? Do the contested groups, I'm referring here to ethnic groups in the borders, taking an issue of uh, border from and this is This is, yeah, to me, this is going to be one of the, uh, I mean, most difficult challenge that is going to face um, the states. So, do the contested groups share these solidarities? So, maybe perhaps to, to understand the cartographic lines, whether we are willing to go, um, um, uh, 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 say, whether we are listening to the oral narratives, whether we are listening, we are willing to listen to the linguistic contours. Uh, um, so this can be this can this can be a way of, for example, taking one issue, looking at a border disputes, listening to the narratives of the ethnic groups in in, in the borders, for instance. So I think this is where I think and this has to start with academicians. I think, I think that that would be my take. If need be, I can come again. Yes. 
Uh, can we now move on to uh, Professor Anand? Uh, you know, how does one necessarily recover the alternative voice? Uh, you know, if we don't want to talk about mainstream nationalist, uh, you know, uh, narratives, uh, how does one necessarily talk about the alternative voices? Uh, yeah, let me, let, me, let me try to sort of, you know, I mean, flag, and I'm sure sort of, you know, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, what I'm, what I'm sort of, you know, I mean, pr proposing or, you know, what I'm suggesting is not necessarily going to be very popular. It's not going to be uh, something that, you know, all of us are going to clap our hands. But, you know, I mean, see, I mean, the problem with meta narrative of, let's say, the Delhi nationalism, I mean, which is what I'm talking about. The meta narrative of nationalism and seeking to fit everything into that. The, the challenges to this, particularly after the 1960s, uh, began with, let's say, uh, in, the, in the domain of language. In fact, in the 1960s, you had the language politics beginning with you know, the Southern India, that is Tamil Nadu. And you know, it was language politics, again, root, uh, centered around, let's say, Bhupan Hazarika kind of a, an imagery in Assam and so on and so forth. Similarly, like, you know, I mean, we, we did have, you know, so, uh, um, uh, identity politics, you know, coming to the fore, which was a counter to the Delhi-based meta-narrative Indian nation, uh, which is, I think, you know, uh, uh, for example, you know, the politics of Gorkaland, uh, the, the long history of Gorkaland and all. To me, I think, you know, uh, uh, as, as somebody who's a, uh, with a sense of history, this this narrative, uh, the meta narrative of Indian nationalism, be countered by counter narratives or little less historical nationalisms. You know, that the concept that you know I think with Sanjeev Baruba talked about it uh, is is to me a little problematic because uh, the, the the I mean the, the the attempt to sort of you know replace a meta narrative of attack nationalism with local nationalism or identity politics, I would sort of, you know, explain. It actually pushes under the carpet. One of the central issues of every society and, you know, when talk about the subordinated, let me also sort of, you know, talk about and, you know, I'm trying to try to sort of, you know, um, uh, rescue the Gramscian idea of subaltern as a class concept. I mean, as a class, not just in terms of sort of, you know, marginalized groups and identity. And when we actually sort of, you know, I mean, if we try to sort of, you know, re rescue the idea of the subaltern in the class sense of the term, it probably then helps us. The, 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 the non-payment of the wages to the tea garden workers in Darjeeling, or the issues confronting, let's say, the tea garden workers that are tribes from Jharkhand in Assam and so forth. And this large, the manner in which insider and outsider politics had unraveled and is witnessed today in, let's say, the academia, particularly the universities in the region. As much as there is a xenophobia about, against and sort of you know, targeting those from the northeastern region in Delhi and Bombay, which I think one of the, one of the participants had raised this question about you know, how how do we feel about it? Let us not really forget that, you know, I mean, the, the outsider, the, I mean, the, 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 the complete kind of transition in the manner the outsider, outsider came to be identified in the short history of the Assam movement. I mean, beginning with, let's say, the, the voter idea, uh, the electoral roles in 1979 in Mongol and taking it until the Nelly massacre, which was, I mean, which, I mean, it, it is this, I think, you know, when we, when we are actually sort of, you know, trying to attempt a counter of the meta narrative, the Delhi centric narrative with, a, uh, what do you, with several uh, such sort of, you know, narratives based on identity, it has the possibility, the potential to run into. I mean, in, in some sense, it's not very different from what the Sivsana did in Bombay in the 1960s, the outsider was the South Indian. So in some sense, if the subaltern in the economic sense, in the class sense is actually brought again to the center. And this development model that I was talking about, the Northeast in some sense was immune or rather sort of, you know, saved from, from the kind of vandalism that took place in many other parts of tribal India 
in terms of the loot of the natural resources and the oppression of the people. The Northeast is now more vulnerable in the post-Washington consensus era. And this is where I think, you know, the meta narrative of, let's say, whom does this nation belong to? I mean, I would actually sort of, you know, I mean, raise this, uh, I mean, the, in, in a very theoretical construct, you know, Ottobauer, the Bulgarian uh, Marxist actually raises this whole argument about, you know, the nation belonging to the people and more importantly, the people, the oppressed, the subaltern, the working class and so on and so forth. And if actually those of us in the academia for a moment actually get out of the people like us syndrome, because those of us who have arrived actually would want to preserve uh, a kind of an identity politics alive, which happened with, let's say, the Tamil language politics in Tamil Nadu, or, you know, the several such movements, let's, let's say sort of, you know, the Sivshana end of it was actually a bourgeois sponsored movement. It was Naval Tata whom the Sivshana actually campaigned for in 1970 against a trade unionist called George Fernandez who defeated, let's say the Congress's SK Patil in 67. So in some sense, I think if we are able to bring this idea of, let's say the subaltern in the economic sense, that probably will be helpful for us to sort of, you know, counter this Delhi knows best in, 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 in again, a kind of a revolutionary nationalist narrative. And that I think, you know, I mean, I, I, I know it's, it's easier said than done, but those of us in the academia ought to necessarily get out of this comfort zone hmm, of what uh, we have got used to in terms of, you know, trying to counter the meta narrative with well, um, um, a lot la large number of sort of you know micro narratives or local histories and all those things because praxis is something that i think is missing in this strategy that uh, that uh, you know we have undertaken i mean I, it's just some kind of a loud thinking mike Vin, uh, Dr. Vinayak, again, sorry to interrupt. We have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Uh, I think uh, somewhere uh, the mics are getting muted and unmuted. So I think that I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but just the last, uh, I think uh, it's, it's only fair uh, that, uh, that we turn the patriarchal narrative, uh, you know, the other way around. And so the last and the final word goes to Dr. Medhi. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Medhi, uh, you've spoken about uh, the women's organization. Uh, uh, I think it's only fair that you talk about how do we necessarily come out of, uh, you know, the, the, the problem of voicelessness, you know, that we, we often see uh, in the representation or in the presentation of Northeast India. And uh, how, do we, how, do, how do we recover the voice, you know? There is a question that was also asked, you know, as we see the, in the chat box, there was a question about gender minorities, for example. There was a question on the LGBTQ community, uh, you know, about their voices. So uh, when you, I, my request to you is when you start answering uh, this question about recovering the voice, uh, uh, you know, probably you could also talk about how do we recover uh, the voice of the gender minorities uh, in, our narratives. Okay, thank you. And uh, let me first uh, uh, engage with the question that you asked uh, regarding going ahead, and then I'll take from Mars question. Uh, going ahead, and first of all, let's flag this problem that there isn't really this authentic, original Northeast voice. I mean, it's an imaginary thing. I don't know. So, uh, and the marginal, especially the marginal, is contingent to our own location. So uh, currently we are doing a CSSR project on looking at uh, women in the Karbi and the Boro movement. So the women that we are talking to are leaders in that movement. So in the larger uh, context of women's movement in Assam or in India, they are marginal. But within the movements that they lead, they are the most uh, prominent leader, you know, leadership figures, right? So there is always that uh, uh, question of marginal to who, which context, right? Mar marginal is always relative to something else. So instead of looking at it as marginal, uh, let's look at it as 
uh, you know, voices which are not represented or underrepresented, right? So that is that is one of the uh, attempts that we are making, and that is an oral history project. So uh, we are basically doing audiovisual recording of their experiences with a little bit of background study because memory plays us right all the time. So one has to do uh, checks and uh, kind of you know studies on that. So one way of, and like Professor Kiki said, and I quite agree with Professor, uh, you know, Anand, that this whole uh, alternative to the meta narrative of the na nation that was propagated within the Assam movement is a very problematic alternative. Right now, we all recognize that, and the, the NRC debate has brought it to the front. The the Citizenship Amendment Act has, again, I mean, released uh, an uh, angst which is which could be seen as both progressive as well as reactionary, isn't it? I mean, we oppose the car because it is against a, a, a certain minority group, but uh, do you also oppose the car because of others? So there, there are these issues that you'd always have in, in, you know, in parts of the Northeast. So uh, having said that, the way ahead for us as academics is, and I, I'm glad that many of the media uh, people are uh, you know, watching this and they're asking other films, and I was thinking of when Kiki sir was talking about land. And we know what is happening to the issue of land and how crucial it is because of the Mikir Bamuni grant uh, you know, case that, I mean, it has been a long drawn issue, but the wire published the story just recently. So that is kind of recent memory or what happened in Bagjan, you know, the Bagjan oil spill and you know, what are the predicaments of, uh, so quote unquote, like someone pointed out, isn't the idea of development itself a subjective? Of course, and which is where we need to question what is you know this industrialized capitalist logic of development. Which is why I wanted to point out that there are alternatives which were suggested, but which were kind of stifled uh, you know down. Regarding the LGBTQI uh, movement in Assam. We do know that the Guwahati Pride has been uh, largely successful. Again, you know, apologies because Guwahati is the New Delhi of Northeast. Absolutely correct, and it's it's a very very problematic, uh, you know, um, situation there. But uh, in in case of the LGBTQI, I'm I'm only aware of some of the organizations which are very active in Guwahati. Hukia is another organization which is active in Guwahati. There are certain other forums. So if you want to uh, get in touch with them, some of them have their own uh, Facebook uh, pages, uh, then you could, you know, uh, but it's, it's important that you bring out this. It's an important aspect that you bring out because uh, how are we going to acknowledge that difference in, in sexuality, not just in terms of gender, but in sexuality and how are we going to articulate that in our agendas, you know, agendas which is not only related to sexuality, because that is where the problem, you know, the moment you think that gender and then only women come, sexuality don't only, no, LGBTQI doesn't come only when you talk about sexuality. I mean, they have a stake in, in everything, right? Just as women have a stake in everything. So they don't, they, they shouldn't appear only when there is talk about gender. So uh, and some of you have asked about films, I think uh, Bangjan Oil uh, Spill has been now made into a film by uh, I'm forgetting his name, but uh, he's the one who made Handuk. So his, uh, his, one of his early film is called Handuk. So if you uh, 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 Google search Handuk, I think you can uh, get his name, uh, Dehingya, or I'm very sorry. I mean, he's, he's a very, very uh, fine uh, um, uh, you know, filmmaker. So he's making a film on Bagjan, as far as I know. And th these are, and, and Handuk itself was uh, disturbing uh, and, and therefore contributing. Because I always feel that the film should, uh, you know, alert us to not just placate us into happy feeling. That is, we have Bollywood for that, right? But independent filmmakers should alert us to uh, this sense of uh, being shaken, you know, being, uh, being torn, being, uh, being uh, even angry or, you know, so something where we can uh, see ourselves as not doing enough or whatever it is. So uh, I, I look forward to this film by uh, the Handuk filmmaker. 
then there are many others who are there and uh, somehow uh, the names are not coming to me if you get in touch with me on messenger or if you email me uh, I, i'll definitely send you names but there are interesting filmmakers coming up now and trust me you know just yesterday day for somebody got a calcutta international film festival uh, best director award in uh, uh, indian language films called god on the balcony i haven't watched it but uh, you know th these are again uh, films that are talking about issues which are part of and these are not mainstream filmmakers uh, mr bora is again you know someone who's shillong connection and so i i'm looking forward to watching his films uh, and and there are others uh, you know which is local kung fu was one which captured the imagination of our you know a, a generation who would not watch asmis film you know so uh, I, I i do and i really like that some of you have brought this up because the media imaginary is so very crucial and i think we academicians have where we have failed i think film filmmakers have uh, uh, you know done it right some of them you know if not all and some of them are really really brilliant so yeah and please do let me know if you uh, get to know of films or books that you think is interesting uh, to read or see thank you thank you so much uh, dr methi uh, it's it's a fantastic uh, you know to to be as part of the panel i think uh, we started off with a time uh, which said that probably 40 minutes and 10 minutes of discussions we've grossly overshot our times sorry uh, and the reason is and the reason is very simple that you know when you talk about northeast it's impossible to probably talk about northeast in about 40 minutes yeah so it's it's only fair that uh, you know it's not that we are justifying our overshooting of time but it's only fair that we are so passionate about the land with which we you know have a sense of belonging and we want to say you know this this idea that we we want to speak we want to say we want to share uh, and so we want to construct the alternative narrative uh, probably uh, the desire is to construct an alternative narrative not just to contest but also to construct uh it's it's also important you know it's it's interesting to have a panel discussion like this uh because uh, as somebody had asked uh, as in one of the questions uh you really have so little of northeast in mainstream quote unquote uh textbooks about either history or culture or or society or even media studies you know most of the most in fact uh, most of the narratives that we actually see most of the books that we see you know uh, probably as a result of uh, the amount of money print capitalism very little of northeast actually gets represented in mainstream text so uh, truly said there was uh, somebody who had just shared uh, uh, an opinion about the fact that very little of northeast is actually represented in books and texts so true and so therefore that is why discussions like this platforms like the athenium is so very relevant for our understanding of the region to put across our voice you know one of the most important things that i must flag here is that uh, as part of an organization we we saw a uh, professor uh, mr sabesachi uh, datta uh, you know as one of the mentors who started up the discussion incidentally he is the director of uh, asian confluence Uh, i happen to be associated with the organization of asian conference in a small way and one of the things that dr um, uh, mr datta tells us at most of the times when we are in a meeting is that we need to actually uh, have a bottoms up approach we need to have the voices of the ground and so therefore probably we hope that athenium would be a platform which would represent and articulate the voice of northeast india uh and it's a fantastic initiative uh thank you so much uh for uh giving us this opportunity to interact with each other uh i think it's it's not just a duty but it's really something that i want to say from the core of the heart uh professor anand uh dr medhi professor kiki uh, it's a fantastic experience uh, to interact with you uh and uh, be part of this panel thank you so much for actually articulating a northeast india so beautifully for the world
you know, Ethereum is Northeast India to the world. Uh, and it's only right that we have the three best ambassadors from Northeast India, Dr. Medhi, Professor Kiki, and Professor Anand, speaking to the world from Northeast India about Northeast India. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Vinayak. I think you um, articulated what Athenium would want to say to our panelists on our behalf. So thank you very much. And thank you also for holding the session uh, together and connecting the dots so beautifully. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, that possibly we could not take up. So if any of our participants wants to address any of our speakers personally, you can, uh, you know, we can share the email IDs with the speaker's permission. Or if you address it directly to Athenium, we can put you in touch and you know you can deliberate and discuss on these questions because uh, like you all agree, there are questions far too many and uh, one hour or one and a half hour is not enough. So we understand. And so we will be very happy to connect you to all the speakers um, with all the speakers permission. Yes, please um, share the email. Yes, yes. share my email ID. Sure. I'm sure. sure you can share my email ID as well. Sure, sure. Please do share my email. I think there is one thing. Uh, questions will lead to questions. That is yes. how I look at it, this course. Please do not expect a definite answer. So if you ask me what is the half of break, I have an answer. Huh? But uh, I think you know, the questions here are concerned. Them. And you know, together, let us actually try and see whether we can find a way out. The way out will be found to be uh, not, the, not the best way. It's important that we keep engaging and looking for an answer, not, not looking for looking for another question to the question that we asked. So sure. please uh, put up the email ID and any emails and I'll answer them. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think it's very grateful to all our panelists that they've agreed to share their ideas. And this is for all the participants. Please feel free to reach out and let's ask as many questions as we possibly um, can. I now invite uh, Ashna to deliver the vote of thanks. Um, it is, again, a part of our process. And we are together with the help of a lot of people. So I think we have to just uh, share a few moments to thank everybody. Ashna, please go ahead. Ashna, are you there? We are not able to hear you. Yes, Piyashi, I think there's some problem with Ashna's PC. Then I think uh, I will uh, quickly step in and uh, present the vote of thanks on behalf of Athenium. Uh, first and foremost, our heartfelt gratitude goes to all the four panelists here. Dr. Vinayak Dutta for chairing the session, Professor, uh, Professor Ketile Zukiki, Professor Krishna Anand, and Dr. Hemjyoti Medhi for consenting and giving us this time and for the enriching discussion. Thank you once again. And uh, Athenium will be uh, reaching out to you time and again for uh, such discussions and ideas from your end as well. Thank you. We are also grateful to Saptarishi Das for helping us design the logo of Athenium. We thank Dr. Sandeep Kumar for his creative inputs and Mohananda Roy for his continuous support in the initiative of Athenium. We would like to thank our advisors, the editorial collective and the digital creation team of Athenium for putting the entire idea and concept together. We thank all our participants from India and across who have joined and patiently heard us and put forward very valuable questions and uh, suggestions that we would all like to take forward. And on behalf of Athenium, we would also like to thank Destiny and various circumstances that has brought the three of us together and which ultimately led to the creation of Athenium. And just as a parting note, I would like to tell everybody that Athenium is yours. It is um, your journey as well. So reach out to, uh, to us in any way you want. Our uh, we are on all platforms. Our email ID website will be shared with you via email as well. And it is uh, also a platform. We are not restricted to the visual medium only. We also have a writer's desk at Athenium. And anybody who wants to write and share their thoughts out across to the world, please feel free to reach out uh, with your ideas and you will find a space for yourself. So on this note, I thank everyone and I have missed out anybody's name. Pardon me on that. So a heartfelt thank you and gratitude to everyone on behalf of Athenium.
If you liked our video and you wish to continue watching it, please like, share and subscribe to Athenaeum.